progress toward the kind of goals and values which I think are important. I'll tell you how much I've compromised, and I, I think this isn't new information, but uh, I distribute it in my literature. When I was here 30-odd years ago, I was a religious pacifist. I was so classified in World War II. You don't quite know how to take that, do you? I compromised. I volunteered for military service and became an infantry officer. And that's about as big a compromise as a religious pacifist can make. I think I'm the only such case in the history of the United States Army, but as far as my credentials as a compromiser, I think I've got the best. And that, and, and that one point should, should uphold that. Now, I haven't particularly changed my views as a religious pacifist. Uh, I'm still uh, opposed to war. I think war is obsolete. I think war is destroying mankind. I think the only answer to human progress today is through peaceful and nonviolent efforts at radical change. And It's all right. I accept full responsibility for this. <clears throat> I'm just trying to illustrate a point that uh, I, I think the important thing is that we have uh, ideals and that we know where we stand, we know what kind of a world we want, before we start making our compromises, and most of the people in politics today don't. And that's unfortunate because that's what's leading this country down the path to tragedy in the world today. You know, the I have some names here. I'll read a few. Mark B. Belon, Terrence L. Hood, Leslie J. Wilbanks, David F. Hubner, Kent C. Taylor. Those names are some of the Western members of the yesterday's list of official war dead in Southeast Asia. There were 32 of them. I'm making this campaign because it makes me sick to think a civilized nation can accept the daily publication of war dead in a war as immoral and wrong as this war. I'm waging this campaign in the fervent hope that the day will soon come when there will be no war, more war dead to count and to publish in the daily newspapers. And with your help, the, the vast help you have already given and the help you have promised, we're going to bring this war, this madness of our society to an end. And we're going to bring it to an end very, very quickly. Richard Nixon set June 30th as the date for evacuating U.S. troops from Cambodia, only because the American people protested the Cambodian invasion so vigorously. And you were part of that protest. You can be sure he would have tried to keep those troops there indefinitely if the people of this country had kept quiet and simply gone along. That may be small comfort to the parents of those youngsters who were killed at Kent State and Jackson State, but just perhaps those young people did not die in vain. Perhaps their senseless murder has finally awakened the conscience of the people of this country. For far too long, the American people have been willing to trust their destinies to the men in the White House, and I don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats, 
And for far too long, the men in the White House have taken the attitude that they could get away with anything just as long as they could explain it on their own terms on nationwide television. Now I believe the tables have turned. The American people have made it clear in the past several days and weeks that they want out of Southeast Asia and as quickly as possible. I believe that the silent majority is now on the side of peace in Southeast Asia. It may be too much to expect that Richard Nixon will ever admit that he made a fatal error in sending U.S. troops into Cambodia, but at least we know that he knows he faces an aroused American people. The quickest way to end the war is for the American people to keep up the pressure on the Congress, and I would like to suggest that we need to get rid of about two-thirds of the present members of the Congress, and to keep up the pressure on the administration and to get rid of the administration at the earliest possible date. You know, I, I made a suggestion about three weeks ago that we ought to impeach the president over this Cambodian invasion. And uh, it's been repeatedly brought to my attention uh, what a foolhardy statement this was that uh, the only thing that could happen, even if it were successful, is that we would get Spiro Agnew as president. So I, I've <laughs> so I, I've had to modify my position, and this again illustrates my ability and willingness to compromise when it's necessary to do so. I now believe that we should uh, impeach both Nixon and Agnew. and that we should replace McCormick as Speaker of the House before that happens. <laughs> if the people of this country go back to their complacency, if they go back to accepting whatever they're told by the administration without questioning, we may never get out of Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia. We may just never get out of anywhere. And this is why it is so important that we put the lie to this assumption that the disquiet on the campuses, the unrest among the citizens of this country is uh, merely a temporary thing. There must be no let up in this pressure for a change in our policy with regard to so Southeast Asia until we have succeeded, until every American soldier is out of Asia. I have spent most of this campaign talking about this issue and about the fact that uh, this is uh, one of the most tragic episodes in the history of this country, that it reflects the adherence to sterile policies which should have been discarded a generation ago, that it uh, reflects a default of leadership of leadership which is unwilling to listen to the people, unwilling to listen to the world, unwilling to face the framework of reality in which we exist today. And this is the, has been the thrust of my campaign, and, and I say this with a sense of regret almost, because when I decided to make this run uh, for the Senate and don't think I just made up my mind the day I declared, because I didn't. I made up my mind at least a year or so ago. It was my fervent hope that it wouldn't be necessary to campaign on the issue of Vietnam. It was my fervent hope that we had come to recognize the evil of what we had done there, that even the politicians, even a Lyndon B. Johnson, could see that they could not continue with the course that we were following and that there would be some hope that within a few months or a year or so that this issue would be behind us. 
And it isn't. It's gotten worse. And it's gotten worse because of the fact that we have today holding power in the political institutions of this country and in all of the institutions of this country a generation of men who no longer are responsive to the people of this country and who no longer understand the realities of the world. So I have taken the position in this campaign, and I have tried to make it clear up and down the state that we're not concerned just with changing the policies in Vietnam. We're con concerned with changing the institutions of this society as a whole, and we're concerned with changing the allocation and the distribution of power within this society. And the thing that begins to worry me a little bit as I see what is happening is that perhaps even if we were to succeed in Vietnam and this great succeed in getting out of Vietnam, this great public hue and cry would force even the bankrupt leaders that we have now to recognize that they could no longer continue that having succeeded in this, there would be a reversion to this complacency, a feeling of victory that we've won, that we finally made our government responsive. We cannot trust our leaders and that we will go back to business as usual. That would be the most tragic mistake that you, as the next generation to hold power, could possibly make because your job has only begun with the end of the war in Vietnam. You have the problem of revamping the political system and the political leadership of this country. You have the problem of revamping the economic system of this country, of making it responsive to the welfare of this people, of this country, and not an engine which engage in the, engages in the destruction of the resources of the earth and in the pollution of its environment till the economic system itself threatens to destroy this planet as a place for human habitation. <laughs> we may have to recognize that the Indians were right after all, that they lived in balance with the environment that they sought the things that made for a good life for the Indians without destroying the uh, environment on which they depended, and that this is the lesson which we, to our regret, have not yet learned as the masters of modern technological civilization. Take them out the reservations now. Right. No, I... I, I think you can see from what I'm saying, and I'm not going to belabor it, that I'm challenging you to recognize that you have no easy solutions ahead of you, that you have no way of disengaging from the crisis that confronts uh, our culture, our civilization today, that this War in Vietnam is merely an incidental battle and a struggle that has to take place for the complete revision of Western culture, Western institutions, and I don't exclude any, even such magnificent institutions as UCLA probably need a, may need a few changes. Our religious institutions, our mores, our culture, all our re going to require the kind of massive change which we've been unwilling to face up to and which we've been concealing for too long. This is the challenge that faces this generation and uh, old guys like me who probably, uh, probably will live uh, <laughs> to the end of our normal lives, we can we can get away without being concerned, but I don't think you can. The way the world is going today, we, we suffer 
the distinct possibility that either through overpopulation, environmental pollution, or war, you're not going to live. So this is the fight that you're going to have to get engaged in, and I, I challenge you to join, and I end my speech here with, and you can ask me questions. Thank you. We have floor mics on either side of the auditorium at the front, and Congressman Brown, for at least a half an hour, will be happy to entertain your questions. Um, I don't know where he got that. I'd be happy to entertain questions, but I will be here for half an hour. Who's going to recognize the questioners? Good. How do you feel? <laughs> Now, who has the mic, and who's going to ask the questions? Um, sir? Go ahead. Let's see. Ahead. We're um, over here? Yes. Okay, ladies You first. talk about massive change. How long, how long do you think this massive yeah. change will take? How long will it take? Mm -hmm. Well, I have uh, this kind of a feeling that we've reached a, uh, a period which is unique in human history in which the kinds of changes, uncontrolled changes that threaten to destroy us have been moving upward at a, at a uh, astonishing rate. That this cannot continue, that there will have to be a plateau achieved and then some new level of, uh, of uh, human achievement in which we are in balance with the earth and within, uh, with it, forces that exist in human society, that we will have to develop a new set of values, a new set of goals to achieve that, that if we don't achieve it within about two or three generations, that we will destroy ourselves. Having achieved it, I look for another period of uh, tranquility uh, that may last for several hundred or several thousand years. But we do have to learn to live in balance with the earth and with the forces that exist within human society, and we don't have much more time to do that. Over here. Last week, Mr. Tunney was here, and I asked him three quick questions. I'd like to ans ask you those questions, and I'd like a yes or no answer. Yes. Uh, I asked Mr. Tunney, do you support the Great Boycott? I support the break Great Boycott, and for 30 years, I have supported the welfare of the farm workers of this state. Do you support... Do you support the Teamsters strike? Which Teamsters strike? The current trucking strike. Look, I understand it's over. Uh, it's only half over. <laughs> <laughs> only half of the people have received the benefits that uh, they've been asking. But did you support the Teamsters strike? That was. I took no point? stand on the Wildcat strike that you're referring to. Okay. Do you uh, do you support the Regents' decision of of uh, not hire of uh, of the Angela Davis case? Absolutely not. Thank you. Sir, uh, I'd like your opinion on the uh, findings of the Warren Commission report and whether you believe that, uh, that uh, it was just a big shock. And we, I'd like to know if you think that we really don't know who is running the country. I'm not satisfied with the findings of the Warren uh, Commission report. I think there should be an extensive reinvestigation, but it should not be entrusted to the same kind of people that made the last uh, report. It should be uh, reviewed by a, a body of uh, recognized independence and accomplishment with no ties to the establishment, and the Warren Commission was thoroughly tied to the establishment. I think there's some grounds for suspecting that there may be a number of important things that have not been revealed to the public. Are you the marijuana? Over here. 
Over here. I'd like your views on the situation in the Middle East with particular, particular reference to the actions of this country, such as its uh, sale of jets, etc. Well, I'll give you the short answer and not give you my whole speech on, uh, on Israel. I think this country should provide Israel with the jets that it needs and accept Israel's word for it. Accept Israel's evaluation of what they need. I've heard some people suggest that we ought to give Israel jets, but we ought to let the Pentagon and the State Department decide if she really needs them or not. Well, the Pentagon and the State Department and the President are all uptight about Arabian oil. That's why we're training Arab pilots over here and doing a lot of other things. I don't trust the Pentagon and the State Department to make a decision as to what's good for Israel. Um, you talked about replacing antiquated institutions in the society. Well, it's these same institutions which make it illegal for me to smoke a plant or to uh, eat certain mushrooms or do that trip. Uh, what do you plan on doing about restoring my personal freedom? What do I plan to do about destroying your personal freedom? Restoring, restoring. Restoring your personal freedom. <laughs> well, I'll do everything I can to restore your personal freedom. What are you going to do about legalizing marijuana? What? What are you going to do about legalizing marijuana? Well, I have taken this position on marijuana that uh, if the best uh, available objective uh, medical evidence indicates that it has no more harm than alcohol and tobacco, I'll favor treating it the same as alcohol and tobacco. Uh, uh, you stated a few minutes ago uh, that Speaker McCormick you know, is not representative of uh, progressive elements in this country. <laughs> And uh, I wholeheartedly concur with that decision, or that uh, point of view on your, on your, on your part. Uh, however, I believe that about uh, some time ago, the members of Congress, or the Democratic members of Congress, had an opportunity to uh, decide uh, between retaining Speaker McCormick in his position or ousting him in favor of a more progressive uh, younger man, uh, more, Mr. Morris Udall of uh, Arizona. And, uh, that uh, over a, about a hundred of the most progressive uh, Democrats in the uh, uh, House of Representatives decided at that time that they would vote for Mr. Udall in preference to uh, the incumbent Speaker McCormick. Now, I've also in the impression that you voted for Mr. McCormick at that time, and I was wondering if you would please explain this uh, apparent consistency in your vote. Well, if you'll explain the absolute falsity of your information, I'll be glad to explain anything. You, you just don't have the facts, and I'm very sorry to hear this. The facts are just the opposite of what you've uh, purported to represent. I voted against Speaker McCormick and for Mo Udall when the occasion for such a vote arose in January of last year. What you're referring to is an effort by Waldy to censure McCormick uh, about three months ago in which Mo Udall didn't even concur and which in the opinion of Mo Udall and most of the other people seeking to replace McCormick, there was a substantial setback to the efforts as a result of this particular resolution. I wasn't there and I didn't vote on it, but that's the facts of the situation. Thank you for your answer. Congressman, what is your stand on freeing Bobby Seale? Yeah. Well, I have not uh, taken a public stand on the specific question of freeing Bobby Seale because I don't have all the facts on Bobby Seale. Now, if you want me to give you an opinion, I would say that Bobby Seale is entitled to justice, that he hasn't received it, and that uh, if that justice uh, were administered as it should be, he probably wouldn't even be under indictment or threatened with jail at the present time. But I don't have all the facts on the case, and I'm not going to make a categorical statement right now without having those facts that I think Bobby Seale should be freed or should be imprisoned. I think it would be ridiculous to expect that kind of a judgment without full access to all the facts. Yeah. <laughs> 
I have two questions. First, why did you vote against the Philadelphia plan, which would allow minorities to become part of the unions to work? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I voted against uh, the Philadelphia plan, which is a plan developed by Attorney General Mitchell to <laughs> establish quotas for black employment on federal contracts. I did so because I don't trust Attorney General Mitchell and his touching concern for the blacks. I did so because, in my opinion, this was a ploy to divide the blacks and the labor unions, neither of which supported the administration. I did so because, in the opinion of the Controller General, the Chief Legal Officer for the Congress, it was uh, unconstitutional to uh, enact such a measure. I did so because, in my opinion, this would not create one single new job for any black because all you had to do to conform to the quota would be to switch a black employee from a private job, which is not regulated, to the, same, to the, to the federal job, which the same contractor has. You could be in compliance with the quotas and still not have established one single new black job. And lastly, I preferred the Chicago plan, which had already been adopted voluntarily with the cooperation of the blacks and the labor unions, and which was working successfully and is being extended all over the United States. Sir, what are you going to do, uh, if you're elected, about the draft? The same thing I've been doing up to the present time. I voted against the draft in 1963 and 1967, and I'll vote against it in 1971. Thank you, sir. I might say that I'm the only Democrat in Congress that has that record. Mr. Brown, you said that you believe war is obsolete and you don't support the war in Southeast Asia. Do you believe the United States should support at some time some wars waged in other countries by money, by jets or whatever. What are the circumstances in which you believe in war, if you do, and what are the circum... Do you have an overall um, sort of an alternative to war if it is obsolete? Yes, uh, I, I think this de deserves a lot more exploration than we can give it here briefly. My basic thrust as a uh, member of the Congress has been toward trying to reverse the overall policy of this country, which is based upon a, the belief that we can continue to adhere to the old style balance of power politics in the world, that we can enforce our will around the world, that we can determine for ourselves unilaterally what we think constitutes our security, and we can enforce what we think is necessary for that security around the world. I reject this whole framework of policy, and I have been trying to reverse this completely toward uh, what I thought were the aims of this country stemming out of the tragedy of World War II, which was to develop a system of international law, international peacekeeping, an international organization which could begin to uh, serve the role <coughs> of enforcing peace in the world, and I mean enforcing it. I mean that it should have a framework of, uh, of law and precedent which could guide it in uh, settling disputes, that it could have a military force which would gradually grow in size and strength while the forces of the great powers would be at the same, point, same time reduced, and that we could reach a point in the world, not where everything was all peace and harmony, but at least where conflict was controlled and where we had uh, an international body widely respected by all the nations of the world which would carry on the, the role which we normally uh, assign to a peacekeeping or a police type function for maintaining a degree of order. Now that has been my goal. Now it, we have not even come close to the process of turning around our policy of, uh, of uh, unilateral enforcement of our own political decisions around the world. We may be on the verge of doing that if we elect the right kind of people over the next two or three years. 
And then we began the, the steady and slow process of building this new structure. It will be beyond my view to say when this will be a peaceful and not a violent world. Because whether we have international wars or whether we have revolutions or whatever you want to call them, I, I see no end in as far as I can look into the future. I see only the hope of controlling them and avoiding a, a massive war between the great powers. As far as I'm concerned, I would reject the use of American force for carrying out our policies in the territory of any other country in the world. I would reserve American power for self-defense only. Sir? Yes. Is, would you be willing to obliterate the draft perma permanently and forever? Because it seems to me that I understand that you're, you're willing to abolish the draft right now, but there are some circumstances where you would uh, condone this involuntary servitude? In the event of a national emergency which would require a massive army, uh, I would uh, support the, uh, the existence of a draft. Uh, I, I think that this is highly unrealistic that it, such a situation will ever occur again in, a, in our history because I doubt seriously if we will ever have a war in which uh, massive numbers of, of, of uh, uniformed soldiers are involved. So I, I don't see any realistic possibility that we will need a draft. I also don't see a requirement for a massive military establishment anywhere comparable to what we have today. And it, is, it has been my goal in seeking an end to the draft, not just to end the draft. I'm well aware of the dangers of a large so-called professional army. Most of the army today is a professional army, all of the officer corps and most of the non-commissioned officers are uh, volunteers, professional soldiers, and the real threat to this country is from the over-militarization re represented by the maintaining of a massive military establishment, five million men on the payroll of the Pentagon, another five to ten million on the payroll of their allies in the great defense corporations, and this is too great an influence over the life of this country. It must be drastically reduced, and under those circumstances, I think we can live with a voluntary army. Okay, I have a second question. A second. Sir, I have a second question. Uh, if you're elected, do you have any plans for eliminating the Palestinian refugee problem? Yes, I do. That's, uh, a, a, compre that's a part of uh, any comprehensive review of the Middle East. Uh, we cannot end the trouble in the Mideast without solving the Palestinian refugee problem. We cannot end the problems of the Middle East without taking it out of the arena of the Cold War. It's a conflict area right now between the great powers, and that conflict must be resolved. We cannot end the tension in the Middle East unless we're willing to provide massive support to the economic development of the Arab countries. You cannot have a society, as Lincoln said, that's uh, half slave and half free. You can't have an island of affluence in the middle of a sea of poverty in the Middle East and expect not to have tensions and war. All of these things must enter into a solution of the Middle East problem, not just whether we ship jets to Israel. Two questions. First of all, what is your stand on the legalization of abortion? And secondly, what will you do to curb the population explosion? <laughs> I've absolutely committed myself to having no more children is my contribution to that. No, I, uh, I, <coughs> I have uh, been deeply concerned about the population problem for a number of years and uh, just to be very quick about it, I have supported, have introduced, have drafted the most comprehensive uh, set of bills uh, in this area of any member of Congress. This includes all of the recommendations of uh, two presidential commissions which have studied the problems of population, and it includes 
a variety of tax incentive and tax disincentive bills to encourage small families and discourage large families. And I will continue to press for the most effective possible federal program in all of the areas which need to be approached uh, for curbing population. With regard to the first part of your question, I would support uh, a federal legislation dealing with uh, abortions uh, comparable to or perhaps somewhat better than the law now in effect in the state of New York. Congressman Brown, what do you consider as a realistic possibility the chances of impeaching President Nixon for his illegal, immoral usurpation of constitutional power in invading Cambodia? Well, there is a national movement been organized for impeaching Nixon and Agnew at the same time. Agnew for uh, violating the federal law that uh, prohibits someone for crossing state lines for inciting to riot. <laughs> I have had uh, a legal staff research this problem and frankly there's no question but what there's adequate legal grounds for an impeachment. My only problem is, uh, should I spend my precious time over the next few weeks uh, working on an impeachment of uh, Nixon and Agnew, or should I uh, give some other uh, goal a higher priority? And, and I'm not talking about the primary. I, I quit worrying about that. Uh, the, uh, the other major uh, program is that which is now currently being carried by McGovern and Hatfield in the Senate, by, uh, by the uh, Cooper Church Resolution now being debated in the Senate. And uh, it's my view that both of these are going to pass the Senate, but that they face problems in the House. And it is my intention, as the highest priority for my personal effort, the day after this election to return to Washington and mobilize to my fullest ability all the forces in the House to uh, support a similar action in the House when the defense appropriation bill comes up. <laughs> after we've won that fight, then I'll consider impeaching Nixon and Agnew again. Where are we now? Over on Before this I ask my question, I want to make sure that I'm clear as to one of your views. Sure. It seemed to me that before in your presentation, uh, you indicated, uh, when speaking about revamping the economic institutions of this country, you seem to indicate that the economic institutions of this country should be revamped so that they serve the needs of the people. Right. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, can I then assume that what you're talking about is revamping the economic institutions of this country so that we have something along the lines of a socialist democratic state so that the means of production and our tremendous technology is used to serve the needs of the people as determined by the people instead of the present situation in which these fantastic means of technology are motivated simply by profit. Well, that's... Uh in other yeah, words, I think we should look for models of an effective uh, economic system wherever we can find it, including uh, the socialist states, the, uh, the, uh, the states which use the mixed economy, and we should even look to any examples we can find of an effectively functioning free enterprise capitalistic market system, which we haven't had in this country for a long time. And we should use uh, our own reason, we should use democratically controlled planning to make the economic system responsive to the true needs of the people of this country. And what the mechanisms will be will probably be considerably different from what we're doing today. And, and I am not going to announce at this point that I have decided to campaign on, a, on, on adopting a socialist system for the economy in this country. I frankly don't trust a socialist bureaucracy any more than I trust a capitalist bureaucracy. May I then ask, sir, what idea you do have, what type of system you do have in mind which would make the technology responsive to the needs of the people? Do you have any ideas about that all? And if not, sir, why haven't you, you know, 
examine the facts, and come to any conclusions? I have a lot of ideas about how to make the economy responsive to the needs of the people. And uh, I will, uh, will and have made these ideas clear during the course of this campaign and in speeches that I've been making for years. Uh, I propose the approach of a first rather basic approach of uh, setting certain goals for what we want our economy to accomplish. In other words, do we want to have an economy which is, uh, has as its highest priority the turning out of more hardware products every year, or do we want to have an economy which serves other needs of, of the human being? And we are not agreed on this today. Those who control the, the economy use the media and use their control over the media to enforce their own goals, which generally are that of buying some unnecessary product, which may not only be unnecessary but harmful. And we've got to put controls and limits on this. And we've got to establish goals for the kind of services that are important. And these, this kind of uh, gradual process uh, must be enforced by regulations and controls at all level of government. And I'll amplify on this uh, at a later date. I want to try and get as many uh, questions here as I can. Congressman Brown, more? you're a candidate. Two more questions before you all get tired. You're a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate. If one of your two opponents for that nomination, Congressman Tunney or Supervisor Hahn, were to win that nomination, would you be willing to support them in the general election? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Yes, I've uh, responded to this question many times, including last night, where Congressman Tunney really made what I thought was a very effective speech. Uh, he is sincere. He's very adaptable. He's, uh, uh, he, he <laughs> Now, I don't want to be facetious about it. I've said over and over again that I will support the Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate because he is incomparably superior to George Murphy. <laughs> That's another example of my willingness to compromise. Sir, a lot of us are going around uh, trying to get people to sign the Hatfield-McGovern Amendment to end the war. Could you please clarify a rumor? I heard that last week you told a group of students at Valley State not to go around circulating petitions, not to sign them, because the amendment is token and because it's playing in the hands of the administration. Well, I don't even think I was at Valley State last week, and I know I never would have said anything like that. I've uh, been encouraging the, m the m maximum public effort to gain support for the McGovern-Hatfield Amendment. It's highly significant. It deserves a, a, a national support by every campus in this country and by all the people of this country. It's a true, crucial confrontation between the President and the Congress, and it deserves every support it can get. Thank you.